I'm Jerome Ossentowski from the Central Rocky Mountain Permaculture at 7,200 feet in central Colorado. We have an acre of edible landscaping and 5,000 square foot of greenhouses, which are mostly in forest gardening now. And we, um, this talk is going to be on succession. So I've had the privilege to walk on Basalt Mountain, which is in my backyard for about 45 years. And uh, it's pretty much un undeveloped. And I get to look at um, all the ecosystems and all the uh, systems and, and the natural forest guilds that are there. And um, what I've discovered is it's actually just a, a pile of rocks with some a thin veneer of vegetation. And as you can see, this scree, um, the lichen is eating away on the, on the rocks. and. Uh, a, a few um, uh, squirrels have forgotten ab about a couple of dug firs and they've sprung up in there and the aspens take over the springs and the, the um, scrub oak encroaches everywhere. And um, I'm a big fan of um, Edgar Tolle because he knows how to um, talk about nature and because rocks have something to tell us. And so we, we take a lot of time out for hugging rocks and walking through the sage and doing aromatic um, therapy and I'm sure the deer do that too and take a nibble here and there for parasites and my favorite my favorite place is in the aspen groves and this is where we really get our inspiration for for forest gardening this is where we look at the models of how how the natural world grows and what the combinations are and how they interrelate and how they cooperate and um, with the overstory and the uh, midstory, and and um, this is a another shot of of a, a Murray Lush spring coming down, and I'd love to just stand there and listen to the water and take it all in, and then uh, once you um, embrace and once you uh, accept that nature, it accepts you, and, and you're not alone. And if this, if the mountain is a uh, is a mother, this is the Virginia here. And this is a, a forest garden is, a, and this is my succession from 1988. And um, you can see we started out with annual production. We did uh, a lot of salad greens and you can see the soil that I started with. Uh, this is a one acre, in my first greenhouse. And in front of that, we grew um, spinach in the, fall planted and then we went into basil and a lot of salagrins. We did all the research and development for the, the, the yuppie mix that you eat in the markets now. And um, we learned a lot. We grew alternate crops every year in, in these simple cloches. It was zone three back there where I live back then. Now we're zone six and I have some zone seven areas in my forest garden just from creating microclimates. And fast forward to today, um, the forest garden is bursting out over the entire uh, one acre. Uh, the centerpiece is my new greenhouse, which um, is tropical, and the passive solar home. Um, it, there's another greenhouse attached, which is Mediterranean, and there's a PV system up there. And um, again, the landscape around me hasn't changed, but uh, we built soils uh, over the last, you know, 20 years, and these are some of the gills. Um, every terrace has a different guild, and uh, there's an overstory, a midstory, understory, medicinal plants, perennial vegetables, some annuals, um, hollyhocks for bringing in the bringing in the bees. Um, this is our our Mediterranean greenhouse, and in front of that we plant uh, insectuary plants and medicinal plants to bring in the pollinators to go inside the greenhouse. To, and on the east side we have four different grapes trellised up and they st spill over in the greenhouse. And on, on the um, right side is all the uh, 
forest garden gills and they spill over to the fence line and all the way down over the fence down an 80 foot ravine down into the spring. So it's, it, it, there's a lot of abundance and um, we just can't, uh, we actually had to use machetes this year uh, to, um, to get in and clear out some of the things. It's like you in the tropics and this is at 7,200 feet. Inside the forest garden is a, a, a fig forest inside the Mana greenhouse is a fig forest and we get five months of figs and the figs intercept the solar radiation so there's no cooling problems for the solar house and the, and the greenhouse and we get 50 figs to propagate every year from this so the, the, the fig tree is a better solar collector than the PVs on, on the roof because they're only 30% 30, 30 efficient I think this is about 300% efficient in, and collecting the solar radiation. We have a small pond which creates another microclimate. The ducks are eating, uh, swimming in their dinner of duckweed and uh, on the other side um, that's the zone 7 where the sun in the spring hits the water reflects up and you get double sun on the rocks and so I have all these exotic plants over there that I can't grow in the other places in the greenhouse or in the forest garden and there's a pinion tree that has um, it's used as a trellis there, and uh, the grapes are all the way to the top of the pinion tree. We have 25 different varieties of grapes. So it's a very lush landscape, and we can use slope to our advantage. So we don't have to worry about shade because we use stacking, and um, the rocks create microclimates, like you mentioned. You know, it's every every um, southern exposure is 300 miles south, so I'm already down in New Mexico to start with, right? And, uh, and then we have all the medicinal herbs and ground covers and, and sometimes you have a, a very special gift from, uh, from a seedling tree. This is a seedling mulberry tree and I call this basalt bliss because it's a three month production. We're still eating mulberries now and there's a lot of green ones on there, white ones on. Um, and I have four or five other mulberry trees, uh, seedling ones, but, and they're scattered around the whole garden and they're in different microclimates, so we get every fruit, fruit fruits for about four months. Now, most of the time you have apricots and in two weeks they're gone, but I have so many varieties, 20 varieties of apricots, they're in different microclimates, so I'll be ap eating apricots or in, in, in another month from now, and we started in June. So cherries the same way, we have early, late, and middle season ones, and they're still on the tree. We're, eating them when I left. Um, another gift from God, um, a plum peach cot, which is, came through off of a seed. And so it has a, a peach, plum, and an apricot taste. And this is just a seedling that I was going to pull up and I forgot about it. It was off the side of the garden. I just left it there. So we have to trust in the seed and we're saving now all the seeds from every apricot and washing them, putting them in the freezer, and then we're going to do seedling trees from those and all the other cherries and other things except for apples. So grapes, 25 varieties of grapes, uh, mostly table grapes, but I think with climate change, um, all of this fruit is going to be moving higher up in elevations up to seven, 8,000 feet. A lot of the vineyards that are in lower elevation in Colorado are, and, and and peach orchards are losing their fruit every, every other year, or half of their fruit. So they're going to be out of business. So when in doubt, go higher. Peaches, the same way. Another, uh, we have 15 different kinds of plums. We've already eaten these and put them, put them in the freezer. Uh, we're looking for Mirabella de Nancy uh, coming on really late. It's a very nice small French plum. Apples, 20 varieties. We salvage some of the heirlooms that are down in the valley. They're 100 years old and graft them onto good rootstock. And I have many good heirloom varieties myself. I have some in my bag, backpack right here I'm eating right now. And some crab apples that are delicious. And uh, This is a typical harvest from uh, one day. Uh, we don't sell anything anymore. We uh, burned out on uh, market farming and we just give it away, trade it and put it up for the winter and we have smoothies every day with bananas and figs and and I was thinking if we have any bug out bag people here uh, that have their pack ready to go 
Um, this is how you can live out, out in the wilderness if you are ready to take that challenge and that leap. Um, and we build these, uh, since, since we've filled up the, the, um, the forest garden, we have no place to plant anything except unless a tree dies. So we're going up in the pinion and junipers, which we had to clear a little bit, and we're building these, I call them Polish hugoculture hugo swales. Um, and we have students doing the earthworks, and, um, and they're amazingly productive. Uh, we just land all the dead branches on a contour, dig a trench underneath there, and last year in this one we planted squash, now we've got garlic, and then we move into the summer crops, and there's just a thin veneer of soil in there. But it grows like crazy. There's a lot of mushrooms in there. Uh, we scatter them, and so the mycelium is going. This will eventually be a, a, a forest garden. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to watch the, um, the transition, and we've already got apricot trees in there, and the, the, the deer come in. They eat what they need. They never bother our food. They, the wild turkeys uh, come in there and do, eat all the ground covers that I planted for them. Uh, we just uh, we dance with the bears, you know. Um, things work out, and then going back to uh, our annual production, um, inside we planted annuals for 15 years or so: uh, basil in the summer, salad greens in the winter time. Uh, these are different crops every year. I have an archery range in my uh, greenhouses all all the time, I'm just shooting my bow. Um, different crops. And then eventually we gutted everything and sheet mulch the, the beds and put in a perennial polyculture in a very pr primitive greenhouse, a uh, wooden greenhouse. Um, and a few years later it burnt down and that was a blessing in disguise because I was able to retool and build from, uh, with different technologies and different materials. I salvaged all the steel for this greenhouse in fact, my entire house is, is built from salvage. And uh, it was a community effort to get it back. And um, it, um, now it's a, a beautiful, lush, tropical greenhouse. And we build our soils again with sheet mulching and hugo culture um, right in place. And while we were building them, we were growing our annuals um, in, one, for one in one gallon pots. So we could immediately plant it and get into production and let the soils digest. On the left is basil, and then uh, we have tomatoes and eggplants all the way. This is eventually going to be a tropical greenhouse. But in, in a few months later, on the west side, we planted our tropical perennial polycultures, all the pioneer species that you would plant in the tropics. And, and we planted an understory, a pulse crop of brassicas, favas, and stuff. So we got immediate crop harvest out of that while, uh, while the, the, the perennials were, it, it only takes about a, less than a year for the entire thing to close the canopy. There's a sleeping platform in the corner. Um, the, the way we heat these greenhouses with, is, is solar geothermal. Um, I call it uh, Polish geothermal because I, I spent 20 years helping to develop this program. This, the tower in the back is the uh, intake tower for the warm air in the greenhouse that we store in the soil uh, and we can bring it out at night. So it's very simple technology. Um, you just bring in the warm hot air into the soil and that's your reservoir and you bring it out with the same fan, the same direction. Again, our archery range there. This is another place where I hang out and my hammock, there's a door to the sauna and the sauna is also a backup. The stones, in here, the patio, the gabion wall are all thermal mass. There's lots of things that heat the greenhouse. Um, we even put in a pallet stove. And this is eventually, on the east side, we left our annuals in there for a couple of years until we could sort out what we were gonna actually do. And um, pretty soon it filled in. That's all passion fruit there that shades the pa patio so it doesn't overheat the greenhouse. So we don't have to cool the greenhouse in the winter, in the summertime. We just rely on natural convection. Um, and then there's, um, the passion fruit eventually died out and we replaced it with annual beans, which again, succession. And uh, now it's got pomegranate, papaya, nitrogen fixing, leucaena, uh, 
with an understory of medicinal plants. So our pharmacy is down there on the ground, indoors and outdoors. There's Brahmi, Gonacola, Ginger, Spilanthes, and Comfrey, uh, all under the understory. So, and that, we have a business where we tincture uh, and sell tinctures. Uh, the papayas on the left uh, has cycled out mostly. Um, the canopy closes in, but there's always room for changing everything else. On the north wall, we have all the business stuff. We have a GOT machine where we make 250 gallons of commercial compost tea and aquaculture and aquaponics um, tank. That's also thermal mass. And there's a, in the um, pathway is a worm farm. We do all worm farmings there. On the other side of that is a tropical nursery. So there isn't one square foot in this place that's wasted. Um, we've had many racks of bananas. It's nice when one of them comes up during a design course so people can actually harvest that. It takes three, three people to harvest that. All the animals recycle our carbon. We have ducks, rabbits, and chickens now. Uh, we bring in free carbon, c cut and carry, weeds, comfrey, uh, nitrogen fixing stuff, and we get brew from the granary, the spent grain from the brewery, so we have no animal costs, and they value add all that mulch, and it comes into our worm farms or goes out on our trees. Uh, we sell worms, worm castings, worms tea. Um, from this, I started a business um, and, and invited a partner in. Uh, Michael Thompson is an architect, and now we do this on a, on a commercial um, basis. Uh, I don't have the slides on here. This is our first uh, commercial project. Uh, it's, it's on a 600-acre ranch and steamboat, and there's a big greenhouse like Phoenix, but much more expensive. They have many other smaller greenhouses, hoop houses for uh, annual production, and there's an acre of forest garden there. And this is the, uh, the sketch-up design of the beds with keyholes and the aquaculture tanks there and the, and the, uh, uh, the trellises and the, the heating uh, tubes in the back there that bring in the soil. Uh, some of these are very uh, commercial, large-scale operations. This is the inside of that. And this, it was planted with my, my plants the same time I planted in, in 09. And it's a lush tropical greenhouse now. This is, a, this is the climate battery, a commercial one going in a smaller greenhouse. And you can see we excavate and then uh, use off-the-shelf ADS pipe and use culverts and, from ADS and just backfill it. And then uh, that, those are the distribution tubes for the... Uh, and this is one we did at the domes. We, we also put uh, the, the climate battery in the domes. And uh, you can see that sketch. And um, this is the finished dome. This is a, a living classroom for a uh, high school that I helped fund. And, uh, and this is uh, the teacher uses as uh, a science. There's Spilanthes right in the bottom corner. That's my favorite, favorite herb. It's an antiviral, antigesic, anti microbial and it's an immune system. Um, and I've worked with uh, Amory Lovings at, at the uh, Rocky Mountain Institute to help with his banana farm, uh, creating better soils with microbes and mycelium and mulching. And um, this is another greenhouse we've done. Uh, it's the CSA Farm School. Uh, they actually grow tomatoes and eggplants here commercially and, and cucumbers. Yeah. Uh, we work with uh, aquaponics systems uh, in Colorado Aquaponics at the grow house. And we put the climate battery in this large hydroponic lettuce uh, operation at the grow house. And uh, they sell uh, their produce to Whole Foods and they use the the money to support some of their educational programs. This, this project is in a, a food desert in the middle of Denver. Um, and Adam Brock is the, uh, one of our, our teachers of the design course, which we are doing for uh, 30 years now coming up. The longest in the world, I guess. So that's my story. Thank you very much, Jerome. That was just awesome. The bananas at 2,500 meters, you know, that's, yeah, something to aspire to. <laughs>
Um, so I imagine there's a lot of questions. So um, who wants to start? Hello, I'm Anthony Melville from London. Um, uh, could you explain a bit more about what a climate battery is? Okay. Um, you know, people walk in my greenhouse and they say, oh, where's, uh, you know, they actually ask me, where's the heat coming from for the climate? Do you have a, do you have a boiler or something? And I just, I take them outside and point at the sun. Uh, you know, you have a, a greenhouse, it gets very warm in there. You close the doors, it gets very warm. And so in the wintertime, we never open the doors. Uh, we just take that hot air and put it in the soil with fans, okay? Simple fans. Forget water, just simple, hot, warm air. And there's actually a phase change that happens when that warm, moist air hits the cool pipes down at three or four feet. And you get, like, an exponential amount of energy flashing um, just like when, when you freeze water or thaw it out, there's this massive energy exchange that it's not just arithmetic, it's geometric. So, does that answer your question? Take the warm air in the greenhouse, put it in the soil with simple fans. Thermostats, uh, one kicks it on at 70 degrees, charges the soil all day long, one kicks it on at 50 degrees at night, and discharges it in the same direction, just taking a little bit of that 70 degree soil out and warming the air back again just for a few hours, right? It's not the only thing that heats the greenhouse. We have lots of insulation, we have uh, thermal mass, we have saunas, we have pellet stoves. You know, we, we're almost net zero though. I mean, we, and with my PVs, everything is run off the grid pretty much. Can I, can I ask a question related to this? My name is Vala from Iceland. Do yeah, you, do I want to you go see there. have <laughs> so you have uh, pipes underneath the soil? Yeah, you saw them. Yeah, yeah, I saw them, and and so then you put soil on top of that, and you blow the air, hot air, into the pipes. You're getting there. I'm getting there. Okay, but um, you have to let it out somewhere so that you push the cold air out. It just comes back out in the in the greenhouse. It it goes in warm and wet, and it comes out cool and dry. Uh -huh. And all that other stuff okay. is in the it's soil. You're recirculating the air. It's, it's so air. simple. Okay, all right. I call it Polish geothermal <laughs> because um, I, 25 years ago, I, was, I did the second one, second climate battery in the United States. And we've been build, we built 25 or 30 or 40 of them already uh, with my partner. So. And you can do it real simple with a garbage can, you know. Uh, we use barrels, uh, you know, free barrels, and, and lot, the pipe is, you know, 50 cents a foot. It's not simple. Anybody can do it. Uh, you can just sketch it out, and, it's, you know, you saw what, you, you, you know, enough on that one slide to do a climate battery. Hi, I'm Hiltje from the Netherlands. <laughs> Any more questions? Hello. Hi, I'm Hiltje from the Netherlands. You're, I can't hear you. Oh, I'm... <coughs> Hiltje from the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, I have the same question about the Polish Hugel swales. Hugel swales? Yeah, Hugel culture. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, um, I read Seth Holster's book. We, we actually did Hugel culture of sorts before we, I even knew about Seth. And um, right behind the pond, we, were, we, we stored and dumped for 20 years. We dumped uh, big logs and boards that didn't have... Uh, paint on them, and uh, eventually we got around to, uh, it was a, just a place to throw things, and um, eventually we got around to putting some subsoil on that, about a, f a foot or so of it, and then we started sheet mulching on top of that and, f and doing annual gardening, and event now it's all forest gardening. You can't slow the forest garden down. It's like, it just, um, it's one of these things, it's a virus. Uh, and you know that. It's just like, you know, we have it all, you know, it just, you plant something, and and it just and it just keeps you know we have plum thickets. One of the nicest um, things about um, plums is that they will spread on their own, so you don't have to plant but one, and you have twelve, and usually they're spaced properly. Did I answer your question? I I, I can't hear you. I was just wondering what is a specific Polish hugo culture? What what's specific about it? What, what, what specific? So it's just an ordinary Hugo culture, but you're just calling okay, it Okay, well, it's, it's a variation on what 
uh, what Seth does, okay? He uses tractors and um, buries big logs. And I do it in a very a simple way where even in our garden beds, if we're, we're using pallets to, I'll throw branches this big. And every, anything I'm cutting, I'll throw it down at the bottom, okay? And then I'm starting to fill it up with anything. Rotten manure, hay, anything, and leaves. And you're just building soil. And you throw some worms in there and some mycelium and forget about it. And, and, and in two years, I have this much in one greenhouse, this much of worm castings that I'm growing, you know, I didn't even show you that greenhouse. I have five of them. So, I mean, you can build soils in, in, in a few months. Uh, you know, six months you're building a millennium of soil, what it would take to do. And forget composting. This is composting in place. And that's what nature does. Up in those aspens, trees fall down, they rot. Nobody goes up there and deadheads. Everything falls down, lays down, rots, comes back up again. It's just na it's natural. So I... We got a, a grant to limb up an acre um, for fire protection. And I took those branches, mostly pinion and juniper, laid them out on the contour. Um, so I didn't want to burn them or chip them. I couldn't have the money. Um, and then just dug a trench behind it. And that's where we made our Polish swales, okay? I can, call, I can say that because I'm Polish, right? I'd love to go, I'm going to Europe next, and I, I'd love to uh, go see what Seth's done, but I don't think I can get in. It's, he's too high, he's a high roller, so it's really hard to get in to see his place. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, one little bit of uh, permaculture myth-busting. Zeb Holzer did not invent hugelbets, hugelculture. Sure. He's just very good at publicizing them. <laughs> um, more questions? All right, yep. Uh, hi, um, I'm doing live streaming. I've got a question from uh, Mull Farm in Kuwait. Um, and they want to know um, what um, are your preventative measures or treatments for spread of diseases um, and pests in your greenhouse? Do you have any? Yeah. Yeah, we have, you know, we have all the pest problems, but we deal with them in natural ways. Uh, uh, because since we're mulching all the time, we have all kinds of shredders. And if you want to put a, a small lettuce seedling in there, forget it. It's gone. You, you, we, we play all kinds of tricks with them. We've had spider mites, but compost tea is probably the thing that cures most things. I, I've gone through the whole gamut of doing you know, other kinds of biological sprays. And now, uh, once the soil is, and that's outside in the garden, we all have no insect problems outside in the garden, never. I mean, now, uh, there's not even any, any aphids showing up because uh, we foliar feed it, and that kills everything and, and gives it a, 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 a boost, you know. And we do that every month now, uh, and we deep root with, with mycelium and, and compost tea, so if the tree's sick, you get that tree. Uh, and we can do that on a commercial basis. Yeah, we've had lots of problems, but we always solve them. We've never been uh, run out of a greenhouse. Um, I can't get people to do the kind of gardening in greenhouses, even though we build a greenhouse for people and train the people. Uh, the annual gardening, um, unmulched gardening is so entrenched in the world with John Jevons and Elia Coleman, I mean, bless their souls. They've you know, done some great work. But you know, that, that whole mentality of not mulching, being afraid of mulching, being afraid of embracing nature uh, is so pervasive that People are going to have trouble with, with, with gardening and insect control. We bring in the insects as well. We open up our garden to lace wings. We sometimes have to introduce uh, beneficials. But mostly, if you have lots of mulch and the soil is happy, the trees are happy, they're not going to be attacked by insects. And, 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 and that's what we've, we've learned over the 25 years. Uh, it's not so that we don't have problems. Uh, we just, we, we're not reacting to thing we are anticipating that's that's the key to anticipate hi Jerome Oops, sorry, well. uh, hello Joan uh, I'm Christopher from Belize and I love you so much I have so much mad respect crazy respect for you you are a mad scientist which is the highest accolades I could offer to anybody um, the question I have for you is what was the inspiration how did you come up with this idea because you're working in one of the most challenging areas to do any farming, let alone, I'm, I live in the tropics and I'm looking at the tropical sections of your greenhouse and it looks pretty good. 
And uh, so where, how did you come up with this? Uh, well, I worked in the tropics too. I, I, I helped the Santanistas uh, do a uh, two acre, uh, I raised money to do a, a demonstration farm in the 90s uh, up in the northern Nicaragua. And I, and I traveled all over doing, you know, tropical consulting and, and growing. So uh, after, uh, after the greenhouse burnt down, uh, I just wanted to do it properly. I wanted to take all the tropical plants that I know about and like to eat uh, and, and grow them. And with the technology that we have, uh, that we've developed, my partner and I, we can do it without fossil fuels. I mean, you know, greenhouse companies are still building, you know, shells that are glazed on all sides. They, they just plug in a, a, a gas heater and they forget about saving energy. But it's just... Well, it's all the things we've learned in permaculture, right? All the things that we, we, you know, follow the principles. If you run everything you do through the principles, you'll come up with what I did. I think that's a close of the answer that I have. There's one more question up there, and then we have to close, I'm afraid. Hi there, Annalise Horden, Permaculture College Australia and Gaia Craft. I am very interested in your foliage spray. Can you talk a little bit about the foliage spray that also might help the people in Kuwait as well? Well, uh, compost tea has been made forever. And uh, I think uh, Elaine Ingram is the, the compost tea queen of the world. And, and then uh, this other fellow, Bob, who makes the GOT machines, the commercial 250-gallon high-pressure compost tea machine that sits in a tote. And um, I saw him demonstrating in Hawaii, and I said, we got to get one of these over here. So I, we've got about five in the valley now, and they're all running commercial businesses out of them. They're taking those around and spraying sick trees, doing uh, meadows doing uh, hay production to increase productivity. You can, we just recently built a really simple one off the internet in a 60 gallon thing with a, all the off, you know, off the shelf pumps and pipes. You can build a, a really simple one um, just by aerating. And then we use our good worm castings and we use um, mycelium, uh, um, humic acid, and um, some, some sweetener, uh, you can use a, some, uh, something to make it stick. Uh, there's one thing I couldn't remember right now uh, that goes in there as well. Um, anyway, it's a brew, and you do it for 24 hours, and the microbes just explode geometrically, and that's what does the magic. Does that answer your question? I mean, you could do it in a five-gallon bucket with with a with a, a you know you know a little bubbler, you know it doesn't matter. You could stick it, steer it, you know, and you could whisk it on with a brush. You know, there's all kinds of ways you can do it, or you can pour it in and water your plants with it, uh, so you get it right there, a nutrient rich foliar feeding. Is we like to play classical music, uh, and the stomatas open up in the greenhouse, and um, and we're spraying it with high-pressure sprayers and. Uh, I, one of my citrus had a really bad black mold that was associated with aphids. And uh, once I started really dosing that with compost tea, that mold would just wipe off and it's gone. And I, I have a, a key lime that has got about three or four hundred limes on it right now. And it's been fruiting for about four years. I have seven different citruses in the greenhouse right now that are fruiting. And 20 in my nursery, 25 or 30 in my nursery that I graft off to onto rootstock that I sell dwarfing rootstock. So I have a citrus business um, because the citrus crop is going to go south in Florida. And I'll, uh, you can get me your citrus from, uh, from me. Me too. Thank you very much again, Jerome Ozentowski.